And Hello. Welcome to our 17th annual Sharpen the Saw Day. My name is Peter Parts. I'm a class four graduate and survivor, and I'm one of the volunteers who helps with this cool event we call Sharpen the Saw. So I congratulate you for being one of the lucky ones to get a golden ticket to join us this week. You win. The speakers we have this week are truly amazing and I hope that every day this week brings you great ideas to share at home or to practice where you're working, which is probably at home too. One of the things that we usually do is introduce everybody around the room. With more than 170 people signed up, introductions would take the whole hour. But one of the things that we would like to do is ask if your company is hiring or if you're looking for an opportunity. This is a way for our EMBA brethren and guests to help each other. In your Zoom link email from Jessica Serpe are the links to give us this information. Be sure to take the time to do this. It's so important for us to help each other. At the end of the week, we will send the job opportunities to the folks looking for the opportunities. The names of these folks will be confidential and anyone who hires one of our family members from this gets invited to a picnic dinner at my house with some amazing beers and wines. Just a minute, somebody just texted. Yes, and my wife said I can do that. I have her permission. Remember, we're all family members and we need to do all we can to help each other. The last time we did this, there were 61 job opportunities for our folks. So with this, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today is the first woman to serve as provost and senior vice president at RIT overseeing all nine colleges. She is famous for encouraging students to take risks, the good kind, and change the world. Her key initiatives are increasing undergraduate student success, expanding doctoral education, improving facilities for instruction and research, and leveraging RID's strength in innovation, creativity, and collaboration, creating collision opportunities for the students and faculty. She has focused on how to keep the highest level of academic excellence during this pandemic. A few tidbits about our next speaker. Her favorite food is Italian. Her favorite team is all San Francisco teams and colleges with tigers as their mascot. Favorite things to do are taking walks, exploring museums and dinners with friends. She's currently reading Leadership Reckoning by Libby Gill. Her favorite places to go are anywhere foreign. Her bucket list is still Japan and Anger Watt. Ellen, thank you for joining Sharp and the Saw. Folks, let me introduce you to our provost, Ellen Granberg. Ellen, it's all yours. Peter, thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm gonna share some slides. Uh, and what I thought I would do today is, is talk about both where we've been and where we're going. And, and where we've been, of course, is coping with the pandemic. And, uh, and I, as I was talking with Peter and, and reflecting on that, I think there's, there's so many leadership lessons out of dealing with a crisis like this. So I'm gonna share a little bit about what we've done at RIT and what I think have been some of the secrets of our success. And then I wanna look forward and talk about some of what's coming uh, for RIT. It's been a, a very, very busy time and lots of good things are going on. So starting with RIT's experience with uh, COVID-19, uh, preparing for this talk gave me a chance to look back. And I actually went back and opened up the communications that I sent to the university community back in March of 2020. And, and I remember uh, writing things like, in the unlikely event of a significant disruption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it, just, it just made me remember you know, how naive we were in early March and then how quickly we had to learn. And so just to give you a little bit of a comparison about 
where we were and where we are. In, in March of last year, uh, about two thirds of the way through the month, actually right about now, our campus closed by order of the governor because the governor mandated working from home for all businesses, which meant we literally had to shut down the campus. We had to send the students home. We had to close the dormitories. Uh, with about one week notice, we had to move all of our courses online. We had students who were studying abroad and the president announced that international borders were closing and we had to get those students evacuated from sites all over Europe and Asia and get them back home. Uh, when the dormitories closed, we had millions of dollars in student refunds for housing and meal plans and parking and, and other kinds of services that students could no longer um, take part in. And really one of the saddest decisions was to cancel in-person commencement. So that was a year ago. Um, today, I look back on an incredibly hard year uh, with some, some sad moments, but also just amazing resilience. So today, what, what we know is RIT was able to keep the virus under control on campus in both fall and spring. We're still doing very well. Uh, unlike many universities around the country, our enrollment held basically steady. We're maybe down 50 students over last year, whereas the average loss uh, for any given university is about 4%. Some universities saw 20% drops in enrollment. Our university finances are solid. Our commencement will be in person, although it won't look like a typical commencement, but our students will across the stage this May. And we are planning for a fall semester uh, with a normal calendar and a much more normal uh, set of activities and classes. So uh, it, it was striking for me to think about where we were, what we knew a year ago and how far we've come. And uh, it was great to have the chance to think about that. So how did we do this? How did we go from emergency shutdown through all of the impacts of, um, of COVID and come out to the place where we are now, which is an institution that is in very, very good shape. And Peter suggested a, a, a four dimension lens onto this that I liked a lot. He talked about operations, finances, safety, and social life. And, uh, and so part of why we were successful is that there was a plan. And it was uh, on the operational side, it was really remaking the campus to support what we called the three W's. Wear a mask, watch your distance, wash your hands. And this required a total rethinking of how we delivered every part of, of RIT services from classrooms to food service to dormitory life. So just to give you a couple of examples, uh, in classrooms, we needed to establish six feet of physical distancing and new uh, uh, occupancy plans for each room that to make sure that that took place. So our architecture department had to examine every room, map out the six feet of physical distancing, and then we, we had stickers that went on seats where students could not sit. And, and the impact of that in some rooms was, was substantial. So some of you have probably been in Ingle Auditorium, which seats 400 students. Under the physical distancing requirements, you can only put 80 students in Ingle Auditorium. And, uh, and that happened all over campus. Every classroom, every auditorium had to be addressed in that way. We also had to figure out how we were going to feed our students. So normally students come in, they kind of bump along with one another, they, they choose what they want in the cafeteria, and then they line up and everyone is close together. People are touching things in common, salad bars and those sorts of uh, things. And so that all had to be rethought. And, and in a very, very short period of time, uh, a, a whole new online ordering system was purchased installed, debugged, and implemented. And those were just two examples of the dozens and dozens of operational revisions we had to make in order to operate campus safely. Uh, 
Our finances, uh, we've done very, very well, but a year ago, we did not know what to expect. And so the leadership agreed on some very stringent financial controls, including hiring freezes and, and stopping almost all expenses. The campus community really responded to that. They did a wonderful job in controlling expenses. And it's part of the reason why we're in good shape financially today. Safety was a, a critical element and, and testing in particular was very important. And so we had to build a, a, a testing infrastructure so that we could monitor the prevalence of COVID on campus. We did that with a combination of wastewater testing. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, wastewater contains COVID RNA residue. And so you can uh, test that and get about a five to seven day advance warning if COVID is on the increase on your campus. So we did that. And we also did student testing. By the end of COVID, we will have done over 100,000 tests uh, on campus. And to, currently we are testing every student every week. It's a huge operation. What was equally important was building a culture of safety for both students and faculty. And I'll talk about that a little more in, in a minute because I, I honestly think in retrospect, that was the most important thing that we did. Uh, and finally, social life. Students needed to have some fun. They needed to de-stress. They needed to be able to get away from their classes. And that picture you see on the left-hand side is uh, an image of Ritter, Auditor Ritter Ice Rink. And so some of you may remember the Ritter Ice Rink. Uh, and they completely remade it as a student hangout and study space. And it's been extremely popular, but it's another example of the kinds of things that needed to be done in order to ensure that we could have a successful semester. And so as I think about it, you know, what, what are the leadership lessons that I took from this experience with COVID? And, and the first is communication, communication, communication. Uh, you know, the it, it's easy, I think, sometimes at a leadership level when you're when you get confronted by an institutional threat in the way that, that COVID was, it was not only a threat to health and safety, it was also a threat to institutional survival. And, and that can often uh, cause a leadership team to turn a little bit inward. And something that, that we realized fairly early on was how incredibly important it was for all of our campus community, our students, our employees, to get regular and clear communication. And so our marketing communications team put together a special website. Uh, the president did a number of town hall meetings. And then he, in academic affairs, uh, particularly because a lot of the issues we were dealing with were so complex, it became clear that there needed to be a forum where people could get their questions answered, get them answered quickly and receive updates uh, on what was happening with COVID on campus and what was happening in terms of the management of COVID's impacts within academic affairs. And so we set up something we called the Provost's Office Hour. And this started uh, last summer and has continued to this day. Originally, we were, we were holding an hour long session twice a week and literally hundreds of people. So sometimes we had as many as 800 people coming to those office hours. And some of them were uh, a, a little bit dynamic. Uh, people were scared. Uh, people had lots and lots of questions. So some of, the, some of the sessions were sometimes a little bit tough, but over time, what I saw was, was that once people came to trust that they could get their questions answered, uh, there was a real uh, sense of, uh, of calm that came over the entire institution. And, and I think communication had a lot to do with that, both our academic affairs communication and the communication coming from the central area. So it's a, you know, it's a lesson we learn in classes on leadership. It's, you'll, you will hear people uh, talk about this. I'm sure you yourselves as leaders in your organizations had to confront very similar kinds of issues. Uh, what we definitely found was that we couldn't do enough of this. A sign, I think, of how things have improved is those sessions are now, they remain once a week, but they're 30 minutes long. And often we're able to adjourn early 
uh, although we still get very, very good attendance. So one of the big leadership lessons for me out of this is just a, a reinforcement of how critical that is, how critical communication is. Another leadership lesson was focus, focus, focus. And, and you know, institutions of higher education are big, unwieldy things. Uh, we're almost like uh, conglomerates in the sense that we have so many, we have a number of different missions. We have an educational mission, we have a research mission, we have an economic development mission. Um, and universities are also highly process oriented places because of traditions of shared governance between the faculty and the administration. Uh, decision making in universities often takes place in a very slow and deliberative fashion. Uh, but that was not how it went with COVID. I think everyone recognized uh, very early on that this was an extraordinary event and that we all needed to drop whatever our individual agendas were and to really focus on making sure our students got educated and our institution lived uh, through the COVID pandemic. And I was personally just so struck at how much got accomplished because the entire university was focused on this common goal. And it, it was such a lesson of the power and ability of a large organization to move very, very quickly when the objective is so crystal clear. Uh, I don't know how easy it is to replicate this sense when you don't have a pandemic, but it was such a reminder of how much power a large organization has to move when the objective is absolutely clear. Uh, the third leadership lesson for me was team, team, team. And, and I, I do think I've been a part in my career, I spent 10 years in, in corporate America working in the telecommunications industry. And I was witness to another very significant event where the universities, uh, excuse me, the, the company's uh, survival was on the line. And then I was, I participated in this one. And something I've learned out of that is when an organization faces a crisis, you, you learn what your organization is made of in a way that is sometimes hard to see in other situations and and something that was so evident to me and and such a a wonderful thing was to see the power of the middle layer of management at rochester institute of technology there are a, a, a large group of people who work at the kind of director and avp level at rit who are incredibly competent and they work quietly behind the scenes every day making this university run. And when COVID hit, it was that group that organized and really responded. Uh, and it was an amazing thing to see. And what I think was particularly gratifying about it was the way in which people worked across divisions. So everybody dropped anything else they might be uh, worried about and came together to do what needed to be done so that we could work through the pandemic and move to the fully remote operation. Uh, it was just, it was a wonderful thing to see because they worked together. There were not territorial disputes. Uh, and we got the opportunity to see that what this institution was made of was something to be enormously proud of. The other thing it did that I think was also crucial is because that team worked together so well, it allowed the senior leadership of the institution, uh, the vice presidents and the president to focus on the policy and strategic concerns. Because we knew, we were shown that the operational side of this very significant challenge was in such capable hands. And that the ability to be able to do that, I think was another reason why RIT was successful. And then finally, uh, the last is students, students, students. And so often last summer, uh, when we were preparing for the students to return, there was worry about whether or not the students would abide by the safety protocols. Um, we had seen uh, for, we, we delayed the start of the fall semester. So we saw some universities that started earlier that had almost immediate 
uh, situations with the virus going out of control because of parties. And we had a lot of faith in our students, but we also knew, you know, they're 18 to 21 to 25 years old. And that's a period of time where people's assessments of risk is a little different than, uh, than older adults. And so, you know, we, there would sometimes be slightly cynical jokes about uh, phrases. There's Mike Tyson's phrase, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the face. And there were jokes uh, during the summer about, uh, about that idea that we have a plan, but the students are coming back and will the, will the plan hold up when the students are actually back at RIT? Uh, and I am so proud and so happy to be able to say that, that our students could not have been better. Uh, they had found ways to have fun safely. We had very few instances of large parties that violated our protocols. The, the prevalence of the vi virus remained very, very low throughout all of last year uh, and, and this semester. And that is really due to our students. And so this is also in certain ways a, a humbling leadership lesson. Senior leaders can make great policy decisions. Middle level leaders can put superb operational uh, plans into place. But ultimately, uh, when your customers or your students in this case come back and they start to work with your plan, that's when you find out whether or not it was successful. And so we did have a good plan and a plan we worked hard at. And I think that we were justifiably proud of it. Uh, but without our students, it would not have been successful. And, uh, and so I wanna give just a huge amount of credit to RIT students who reacted to the pandemic with a level of maturity that was not seen at a lot of universities, but our students really, really came through. Okay, so let's talk about some fun stuff uh, about what's coming next for RIT. And uh, there were a number of things that, that did get slowed down because of the pandemic, but an area, several areas where we were not uh, needing to slow down have to do with the creation of some new facilities and some new programming with those facilities. So I wanna just share that with you and give you a sense for some of what's coming in the next few years. So we opened the Global Cybersecurity Institute, uh, which is a 52,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility. It includes a fully equipped cyber range and a security operations center. It offers uh, education for our students, but also training for government and industry. So there are, uh, uh, there are all ready to go now immersive training scenarios for global business, healthcare, energy, and finance. There's also entry level training available that can help you to grow your own uh, cybersecurity experts if you're looking for them. Uh, and then there's also, uh, I think, a really nice setup for uh, immersive in-person training and the ability for senior leaders in your organizations to be able to uh, really have insight into, to be able to watch your teams respond and, and to have insight into the dynamics of, of the uh, strengths of, of your teams when they're under pressure. And so if you haven't had a chance to see this, or if you have an interest in this, uh, RIT's got some amazing facilities uh, for you to take advantage of. The next one is the what we call the IMLC, the Innovative Maker Learner Complex. Now, this is gonna have a new name pretty soon, but this has been the working title. Uh, this is an enormous facility, over 100,000 square feet, uh, it's going to include 30,000 square feet of new interactive instructional space. And the picture you see here is one of the larger classrooms. Uh, it's a 150 student classroom capable of supporting interactive instruction. So you can see the, um, uh, the digital boards uh, around all sides of the room. There are whiteboards around the room. The students sit in, um, in, in round tables and are able to work together. There will be four rooms like this and another 30 smaller interactive instructional rooms in the IMLC. If you've ever spent time in the construct, we are expanding that space extensively and moving it into the IMLC, as well as creating space for academic teams and clubs. This is an image of the new building. Uh, the, the walkway at the front of this building is the quarter mile. 
the brown structure to the right is the Wallace Library. And then the uh, new the uh, glass box structures that you see there, that's the new IMLC. We've broken ground uh, and uh, we plan for this to be open in 2023. This is an interior view of the same space. So you can see lots of meeting rooms, lots of locations for students to, to work together and, and to uh, uh, work on uh, projects of all types. The next major facility coming online is a performing arts center and a significant expansion of RIT's um, resources in the performing arts. So on the left, there is a uh, image of the new performing arts center that we expect to open in 2024. It'll have a uh, about a 750 seat theater uh, suitable for both musical theater and stage performances. Uh, and then underneath uh, making spaces associated with theater. So scene shops, costume shops, rehearsal rooms, those sorts of things. And along with this is a new program called the Performing Arts Scholars Program. This is a, a scholarship program where students with talent in the performing arts can apply to RIT and apply to become a part of an enrichment program that makes performing arts instruction available to them. So that's another exciting um, new program that we, we have coming online. And last but certainly not least is an expansion of the Saunders College of Business. This is an $18 million expansion that's going to add 35,000 square feet to the college. We recently learned that we're getting a significant uh, grant from the state to help with the cost. Uh, and in addition, we had a, a very generous gift from Mr. Saunders to, to assist us with, um, with paying the cost of this new facility. Uh, there are expanded collaboration in team rooms, support for new academic programs, and enhanced space for academic and industry engagement. And there will also be, this will make possible a dedicated suite for the EMBA program and executive education, including team and conference rooms. And there's a, a nice quote from Jackie Majral at the bottom. Um, she's wanted to express her gratitude to EMBA and Saunders College alums and friends who are helping to make this expansion possible. Except for the state money, this is being uh, completely funded by donations. And so it's it, we are very, very grateful to everyone helping to make this possible. So how can you be involved? How can you help us? And, and there are so many ways to engage uh, if you have an interest. Many, many volunteer opportunities, both within Saunders College of Business and other spaces. Uh, we are uh, focusing a lot on fundraising for scholarships to make an RIT education more affordable for as many students as possible. Uh, if you have not already looked at supporting the Lowenthal Hall expansion, uh, that is definitely uh, an area where we appreciate everyone's help. And then finally, RIT is launching a new society called the Sentinel Society. And uh, this is an, a new organization for individuals who are uh, willing to make annual pledges uh, to support uh, general needs at the university. So I became a, society, a Sentinel Society uh, member just a few weeks ago. Uh, and the idea is to start to create a, a giving community at RIT that is focused on the university in general. So if you have uh, interest in, in working more at the university level, this is a wonderful way to get started. And I think I'm just about hitting uh, the right time. Uh, Thank you so much for um, the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and uh, looking forward to hearing the next speaker. Thank you. Ellen, this is Peter and I just wanna say thank you for everything that you are doing to make RIT such a great place for all of us to call home. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. With this sharp in the saw, we're starting a new tradition. Over the course of the history of Saunders, all of us have been blessed with some truly great teachers. Teachers that have imparted new knowledge to us, not only imparting the knowledge, but teaching it in a way that we can learn to comprehend and su successfully implement it. They made a difference in our lives, they made a difference in our future, and they made a difference in our business. They imparted knowledge and they challenged our thinking with great questions, remember? and offline 
They gave us advice and counseling when we went for help, sometimes many years after graduation. A tradition that we're starting today is called Last Lecture. It's an opportunity for our best teachers who have retired or who are close to retirement to give their words of advice and wisdom to us, not only about the traditional subject matter, but advice about life. The first person to present their last lecture is Bob Boehner. Bob, thank you for being here. Thank you for being an incredible teacher and guide for all of us. The floor is yours. Bob, if you can hear me, you're muted. You un unmute, Bob. There we go. Here we go. Fantastic. Peter, thank you. Um, I am very honored uh, to uh, be here uh, with you. Uh, Peter has been doing Sharpen the Saw, as he mentioned uh, in his introduction, for 17 years. Uh, and I am fully aware of the criteria that he has established for people who are speakers in this, uh, in this program. Um, and it is a real honor to be able to have Peter select me to, to, to speak um, and to be the first speaker for the last lecture uh, series and, and, to, and to be with you. Um, you know, I was thinking this morning, I've been working full time since 1963. Uh, and I'm very proud of accomplishments uh, since then. Uh, two years in active duty in the military and 30 years with Xerox uh, and, and then, of course, law school for three years where I, I didn't work. Um, and, and then the wonderful opportunity for a second career um, teaching in the Saunders College of Business, uh, most specifically in the executive uh, uh, MBA program. This program, the program itself is my legacy. And your accomplishments are what I take great pride in. Um, the, the program is extraordinary. Um, Don Wilson was my mentor when I first came in. Don had a lot to do with uh, me being uh, hired. Um, and and uh, Don really established the principles uh, that guide the program, the commitment to excellence, the commitment uh, to the students um, the, the overall quality of the program and culture uh, of, of the program. Uh, and, and it is because of Don and Don Shrebeck and Tom Cray and others um, that, that the program is as successful um, as it is. Um, and I'm proud of the fact that the successors to Don, the two successors to Don are graduates of the program, um, uh, Jeff and, uh, and, and, and Marty. So this has been uh, just a terrific experience for me. Um, and I'm just proud to be associated with you. And as I say, proud of, of uh, your accomplishments. Um, if I can comment on the title of this lecture, um, or this talk, um, the last lecture, this is the last lecture I'm gonna give today. That is uh, true. Um, I, I taught, uh, Friday and Saturday in the EMBA program, the strategy course. I'm going to teach April 2nd and April 3rd as we kick off strategy two. I'm going to kick off uh, a, an online EMBA program on April 5th. Um, I'm going to teach in the EMBA this summer. I'm going to teach in the EMBA this fall. Uh, I'm going to teach a regular MBA course uh, this, uh, this uh, summer. Um, I plan to teach um, in the EMBA program um, next year, four courses, uh, five courses, four courses, um, and a regular MBA program, one course and two courses um, online. So I'm not going anywhere. Um, so I just uh, am happy to be able to continue my association with the program and happy for the support of uh, Jeff and his team and most happy to be engaged with the students who just like all previous classes, this class is really, really, uh, really terrific. So, um, Anyway, I'm just uh, uh, pleased to be with you and just uh, pleased I'm going to be able to continue my association uh, uh, with the EMBA program. Um, I just wanted to spend some time talking about challenges that you will have going forward. What's the post-COVID world going to be like? 
Um, and I want to do that conversation in the context of uh, the stakeholder model of uh, capitalism that's been endorsed by the, uh, by the business roundtable. Um, and, and so those will be the, the major topics of, uh, of, of conversation. Um, and then as Peter said, I'll just share some uh, insights uh, with you at the, um, at, the, at the very end. So um, onward with um, a snapshot of uh, what's happening with COVID, then some um, advice, I think, on how your business, your organization can accelerate out of uh, what has happened with COVID. Uh, and, and, and by the way, that, that this accelerating under COVID very much reinforces what uh, Ellen said, uh, just the basic principle of setting guidelines and objectives and uh, trusting the organization to uh, execute. Um, and there are perhaps some changes in management and approaches to management that became evident during uh, COVID that uh, will continue uh, as important trends in, in, in uh, oral work for organizations going forward. Um, I want to share with you the perspective of the business roundtable on the stakeholder uh, model um, and uh, talk a little bit about the implications of that that I think will the implications for you from a management standpoint for this notion of the purpose of business and the stakeholder model, and then talk a little bit about leading, uh, leading to the future. So the snapshot, the vaccine, I got vaccinated, that was my second vaccine, uh, I think in the middle of February, it is liberating. Um, I, 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 it is extraordinary. I don't, I'm not scared to walk outside. Um, I, I actually took an airplane ride uh, last weekend and saw my son in Atlanta who I hadn't seen and, in uh, 15 uh, months and um, uh, I feel comfortable going to uh, certain restaurants. So um, the, the, the whole notion of vaccination is basic, basically life-changing. Uh, we know the stock market's doing terrific and is at, uh, at uh, record levels. 6.2 uh, unemployment rate uh, in the US a year ago it was 15% unemployment, by the way. Um, first quarter U, uh, US uh, GDP grew four and a half percent the full year outlook is six to eight uh, percent. There is, are predictions that the GDP in the U.S. will be this year will grow faster than the GDP in uh, China. Um, obviously, and you know that the, the deficit, federal deficit, is at a record level. But the service on the deficit, as a percentage of GDP, is the same as it was in 2000 because of low uh, interest rates. Okay, and as I just mentioned, there's normal normalcy trending travel shopping, restaurants, uh, businesses reopening, um, and, and uh, so forth. So that's one quick snapshot. But we need a perspective on this uh, good news. The stock market's not the economy, and it doesn't create wealth broadly, okay? So 10% of Americans own 85% of stocks. The unemployment rate is the ratio of people working plus the people looking for a job to the people who don't have a job. Today, we have 10 million jobs fewer than we had uh, in before uh, the, the, the uh, uh, pandemic. Four million plus people have left the labor force. In other words, they're no longer looking for a job, primarily because they're discouraged. Women left the labor force at two times the rate of men. I'll talk more about that uh, uh, in a moment. So this is the labor participation rate. Labor participation rate is the number of people over 18 year old, over 18 years old, who are working. Okay, so the total labor participation rate in February was 61 percent, almost 63 and a half percent in January of 2020 before the pandemic. You can see what it is for men: is 69.6 percent for women, and for blacks at, uh, at uh, 60 percent. So this reflects the number of people who have left the workforce um, for various and sundry reasons, some of which we'll talk about here um, on, a, on another slide. The other thing is that COVID has had a tremendous impact on our most vulnerable people. We know the deaths, okay, um, almost 30 million deaths, uh, or almost 30 million cases, pardon me, and 541,000 uh, uh, deaths. 
86% of the pay cuts, job losses, and layoffs impacted people making $40,000 a year or less. Those are people in the service economies, restaurants, hotels, retail, okay? Um, many of which pay minimum, minimum wage or just slightly above uh, minimum wage. The greatest impact of these pay cuts, job losses, and layoffs have been on persons of color and women. Blacks are one and a half times more likely to live in a U.S. county with high risk of health and economic disruption. 40% of Black-owned businesses are in the five most vulnerable industries in the service industries I mentioned, hotels, restaurants, entertainment, uh, retail, and so on. To contrast to that, 1% of the jobs paying $70,000 or more and 13% of the jobs paying $40,000 to $70,000 a year were vulnerable to layoffs, job losses, or pay cuts. So the COVID virus has had a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable population. Again, we'll talk a little more about that in a second. The wealth of US billionaires increased by 20% in 2020. There's other COVID impacts, small and medium sized businesses. They created 78% of employment growth from 2013 to 2018. On average, they have 27 days of cash. So when we do government shutdowns that close them down for 30 or 60 days, um, they don't have the cash to pay employees, um, buy new inventory and so on. So 30% of small and medium enterprises are at risk of closing and a high percentage of those are in vulnerable service industries. Similar impacts on innovation, venture capital declined by 60%, R&D investment globally and nationally declined by uh, 3%, um, and much of the, the government spending greatly was on uh, vaccine uh, development. Uh, major impacts on women. Um, survey of 40,000 respondents. Um, the literature basically points out that during COVID, women were always on, working a double shift, worked their job and then at home, including responsibility for homeschooling children. 25% of surveyed women are considering either downshifting their career ambitions or leaving the workforce entirely. So we are at risk of erasing decades of hard-earned progress toward gender diversity and equality. Um, this data, along with the data related to uh, Blacks um, and other uh, vulnerable groups, highlights the need for more person-friendly, family-friendly, and child-friendly uh, policies by both business and uh, government. About 3 million K-12 students are still not attending in-person classes. 6 to 10% of high-risk students in K-12 have dropped out of the system and can't be found. Okay, there we are homeless or migrants. Uh, a significant fraction of them have learning disabilities. So this exacerbates the education gap, riches versus rich versus poor, black indigenous persons of color versus white, cities versus suburbs. The 20 largest school districts, school districts in the country were the last to open in person classes. Private schools opened and conducted in-person classes, so did suburban schools. So again, it highlights the gap in education between those who are most vulnerable and those who live in richer, um, uh, more um, affluent uh, uh, environments. It also highlights the digital gap. 24 million US households don't have high-speed internet. So the notion of Zoom classes is something that they uh, weren't, uh, they could not uh, access. So what's the summary? <clears throat> Let me use hospitals as an analogy. We've been in intensive care. We're just coming out of intensive care and we're still in the hospital receiving standard hospital uh, treatment. We need rehab. <clears throat> we need to fix and address the problems that we talked about. What are we going to do about those students who haven't been to in-person class for a year? 
what are we going to do about the most vulnerable members of our population who have no jobs and aren't able yet to return to work? There is a risk that COVID is creating a permanent underclass. Okay. Um, and what we need to do is understand that, accept that, and understand that it is going to take us and nonprofit organizations like education and businesses as well as government to address this problem. There's an important role for the private sector here. Um, I, I, again, it is the most vulnerable members of our population who have been most impacted by COVID. And there is a risk that these impacts will become permanent, okay, um, without a, a plan to address them. And there isn't much conversation about how we fix that. There's conversation about stimulating the economy, and that's all great, okay, um, and, and it will work. Um, and we see that in the GDP growth, and we see that in, in the stores reopening and restaurants reopening and services reopening. Um, but we really haven't seen a coordinated plan for addressing the impact on our most vulnerable, the most vulnerable members of our population. Okay, so let's talk about you and your business and how we accelerate uh, out of COVID uh, and grow uh, and, and, and uh, just recover rip rapidly uh, uh, with your business. Forget incrementalism and half measures. High aspirations seize the moment full speed ahead. So there's three priorities that I think that you should think about. Your business portfolio, your performance culture, and your digital transformation. So let's just talk about each of those um, quickly. The portfolio, the business portfolio. What are the businesses and business and market segments within your organization that present opportunities for growth? And how has COVID changed these opportunities? We need to be decisive, tough decisions and take actions. Which businesses are we going to invest in because there's significant growth opportunity? And which businesses are laggards? These are tough decisions because the businesses that are laggards are likely to be legacy business in which there's a significant emotional commitment by the employees and by management. Um, but it, again, it takes tough decisions of hard-nosed management to understand the opportunities for growth. When we see those opportunities for growth, we need to fund and staff to win in the marketplace. So examples of um, important and uh, business portfolio decisions, Disney's doubled down on streaming with Disney Plus, and they basically are de-emphasizing releasing films to traditional theaters. Disney understands that with streaming, there is likely to be two winners. Netflix will be one of them, and Disney Plus wants to be the other one, okay? Um, and as I mentioned, they are doing releases directly to Disney Plus. Best Buy grew online sales with curbside delivery. Uh, Target and Walmart grew e-commerce to the point where they are successful uh, competitors uh, with Amazon. They did this Best Buy, Target, and Walmart by taking decisive, quick action really to address their overall business model and by taking action that leveraged their existing strengths and their existing strengths are an omni-channel. So if I order a computer from uh, Amazon, I'll get it in two days. If I order a computer from Best Buy, I can drive there and pick it up right now. Okay, um, so it just basically the omni-channel uh, becomes a strength of these uh, organizations. And of course, Target and Walmart with grocery delivery uh, really established a, a significant new uh, business opportunity. What about performance culture? What behaviors, efficiency, new business models create a necessity because of COVID should become part of the ongoing business? Uh, decentralized decision-making, faster decision-making, a bias for speed, simplifying processes, okay? So um, Ellen really discussed uh, much of this when she talked about how the middle management um, groups at uh, RIT responded to what needed to be done with COVID. 
that senior management could set objectives and set priorities and set policies, create policies, but the hard work associated with execution was done by middle managers who really stepped up um, and um, created um, new business models and new approaches to education. Well, that's happened uh, in, in multiple businesses um, as well. We have online medicine. I actually bought a car without visiting the dealer except to pick up the car. Okay. Um, the Best Buy curbside delivery, um, they had planned to test it for a year to see how it worked. COVID hit in March. They executed it in April nationwide. Okay. They, basically, the necessity, the business necessity caused them to quake take quick and decisive action and their store managers and store employees responded in a way that made that uh, strategy a success. Digital transformation. The message is digitize everything. Customer contacts, employee contacts, order entry, supply chain, HR processes, use digital technology to accomplish broad objectives, okay? Managing the customer touch point, collaboration and teamwork frictionless management of the value chain, digitize everything, okay? Um, that is, is one of the important trends from COVID, which is the deep commitment to the digitization of business processes and the digitization of contacts with employees, contacts uh, with customers. Um, one of the interesting things in terms of behavior is the future of work at home, okay? And a huge number of people who have been successful working at home want to continue to work at home. That is a problem because uh, you don't get the collaboration associated with uh, in-person work, A and B, you don't culturalize the uh, new hires, okay? And help them with onboarding in, uh, into the organization. The other concern is that if we give flexibility to the employees who work at home to choose when they're gonna work at home and when they're gonna come to the office, they'll all work at home on Mondays and Fridays. Okay, and so we won't get the collaboration and inter interaction that uh, 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 that we would like. By the way, there are surveys that uh, suggest this. And so it speaks to the need to come up with policies that really uh, accomplish the best of working from home and the best of uh, working uh, working in the office so you can achieve the collaboration and, and uh, um, and, and, and culturalization that uh, is uh, uh, essential. So you can internalize this, that there needs to be a plan for accelerating out of COVID, <clears throat> okay? You have the knowledge and leadership and insight to set the priorities and lead the change. You can explain why change is necessary. You can understand the barriers to change and why it hasn't happened. And it's important key to understand and co-opt the frozen middle. And, and, and that's what Ellen and RIT's leadership was able to do with the middle management uh, at the operational level at, at, at RIT to really make things happen. The frozen middle really is dedicated to the status quo and is looking for a return to normal. There is no return to normal. There is just a new, faster, more digital way of doing business. Set the course. Create the, create the plan, set the course, um, don't give up, stay focused. And uh, as Alan already said, communicate, communicate, communicate in terms of what the end point needs to be and what the actions, what actions need to be taken. Okay, let, let me transition to another topic that I think um, is important um, and I think will be gaining momentum. Um, government and society are really changing their attitudes toward business. 50% of Gen X and Gen Y believe that socialism will be at least as good as capitalism for the United States moving forward. The socialism that they're describing isn't the socialism that existed in Europe in the, the 1950s and 1960s. It's the socialism of, uh, of Bernie Sanders and of AOC, um, uh, which, which is fine by the way, but, but there is an expectation on the part of um, Generation X and Generation Y, that um, business will become a positive force, positive force for change. 50% um, of the workforce in 2030 will be Generation X and Generation Y. 
Okay, so there will be substantial expectations in terms of the nature of the business and substantial change in expectations in terms of how they're going to be managed. 82% of employees say it's important for their organization to have a purpose. Only 42% said the organization's purpose statement had any effect on decisions, management, or culture. The top two priorities of surveyed employees are contributing to society and having meaningful work. Only 21% of purpose statements refer to obligations to society and only 11% mentioned meaningful work. So there's a disconnect between the senior management perspective, historic senior management perspective, and the expectation of employees, particularly younger employees. Those expectations of younger employees are gonna permeate the entire organization in terms of our expectations of the behavior of our employer, in terms of the expectations of how we are going to be managed. The Business Roundtable understood this and last year def defined uh, a revised uh, purpose of business. The CEOs of these companies are the board of directors of the Business Roundtable. So these are not a bunch of Wahoos, <clears throat> okay? Or Yahoos, pardon me, Yahoos. Um, Walmart, General Motors, Best Buy, Apple, JP, JP Morgan Chase, the Boston Consulting, Union Pacific, Steelcase, Johnson Controls, Cisco, Procter & Gamble. Again, this is the board of directors of the Business Roundtable, the CEOs of these companies, and they are the ones that put together this statement of purpose of a corporation we're gonna take you through in the next two slides. The statement of purpose of the corporation was signed by all 181 CEOs who are members of the Business Roundtable. 100% of the CEOs who are 181 CEOs signed this statement. Um, let me just go through the statement and then just uh, I just want to briefly comment on, uh, on um, uh, its implication for you. By the way, the statement is controversial and I will get to that uh, uh, as well. This is the statement from the Business Roundtable. Americans deserve an economy that allows each person to succeed through hard work, creativity, lead a life of meaning and dignity. We believe that the free market system is the best means for generating good jobs and strong, sustainable economy, innovation, healthy environment, economic opportunity for all. Business plays a vital role in the economy by creating jobs, fostering innovation, providing essential goods and services, make and sell consumer products, manufacture equipment and vehicles, support the national defense, produce food, provide health care, generate and deliver energy, offer financial communications and other services that underpin economic growth. While each of our individual companies serves its own corporate purpose, we share a fundamental commitment to all of our stakeholders. So this is the stakeholder theory of the purpose of business, okay? And Business Roundtable identifies five stakeholders that they are committed to. Customers, further tradition of American companies in leading the way to meeting and exceeding customer expectations. Employees, compensating them fairly, providing important benefits, supporting them through training and education that develops new skills for a rapidly changing world, foster diversity and inclusion, dignity and respect. Suppliers, dedicated to serving as good partners to the other companies, large and small, that help us meet our mission. Communities, respect the people in our communities and protect the environment by embracing sustainable practices across our businesses. Long-term value for shareholders, they provide the capital allows companies to invest, grow, and innovate. We are committed to transparency and effective engagement of our shareholders. Each of our stakeholders is essential. We commit to deliver value to all of them, for the future success of our companies, our, our communities, and our country. So this will be, I believe, going forward, an expectation of all organizations, not just corporations the way they engage with their communities, the way they engage with their um, uh, employees, the way they create value for their uh, the stakeholders, the way they treat their suppliers, um, the way they uh, deliver financial value or social value to the organizations, the shareholders of the organizations or the people that they, uh, um, that they serve. Um, 
th this is controversial in the business press because the business press really wants to continue to focus on creating shareholder value. Um, and um, I just want to make you aware that um, this exists. Um, I, I want to share with you my view that the pressures from government, the pressures from employees, the pressures from uh, customers, the pressures from shareholders will force companies to take the stakeholder view of the purpose of the company, that they will be an expectation that companies will be concerned about customers, suppliers, employees, and communities, in addition to their concern about, uh, about the shareholders. Um, this is a significant change from the shareholder view, uh, shareholder value view of the purpose of a, of a corporation. As I mentioned, the business roundtable are serious business leaders who understand the situation that businesses are facing in the future. Um, and they think that this statement of the purpose of business uh, is important. So the implication is that you are going to become a manager who is responsible for meeting the obligations of the organization to multiple stakeholders, okay? You're also gonna have to help lead your organization out of the impact of the pandemic by taking incredibly aggressive action and focusing on winning, on how you can win in the marketplace and also learning from what you did to handle COVID and adopting the best practices from what you did over the past year to really change the nature of the management of your business and your business processes. Okay, last slide. Peter asked me to share with you some uh, perspectives. So McKinsey says that 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2030 have yet to be created. So you have to reinvent yourself every three to five years. So when Don Wilson first hired me to teach in the EMBA program and I taught Peter's class, class four, it's the first class, um, I taught marketing. I was hired to teach marketing. And I taught marketing from class um, four through class 16. I am, and I thought I did a pretty good job too, but just by the way, I'm not qualified to teach marketing because marketing has changed enough since class 16 that I just am, don't, just has bypassed me. I think I know what I don't know, and it would probably take me six months to get the power curve so I could teach a, a marketing course. But my focus has been on maintaining currency in strategy and in technology uh, management. Okay, so you can't let yourself become obsolete. You have to reinvent yourself every five years. And this just reinforces something that we've talked about before, which is learning is a lifelong challenge and a lifelong uh, undertaking. Technology, competition, globalization, everything changes your organization enough that it really you have to reinvent yourself to maintain your own competitiveness. Um, just another thing, and this just relates to a personal experience. Um, be aware of weak signals related to your company and to yourself. Okay, those weak signals will give you a um, cautionary uh, warning about your company's future um, and uh, your future. You probably will not retire from the company you're now working for. Okay, um, and that's A and B. From my own experience, the opportunity to pursue a second career is absolutely incredibly uh, fulfilling. So just be always aware of what's happening in the company and what's happening with uh, your position in the company. To be blunt, I kind of said, uh, I'm at the end of my runway in Xerox. It's been a good 30 years, okay? I certainly could last until age 65, but it ain't gonna be as much fun as the first 30 years were. Um, and so I decided that I needed to take fairly drastic action, go to law school to uh, establish the foundation for um, a, a second career. And I decided it was better to do it at age 55 than at age 60. Okay, so that's why I said there's a personal 
uh, uh, notion in, in this uh, advice uh, for what it's worth. So anyway, COVID, stakeholder view of business and uh, reinvent yourself and just make sure that you're understanding your future and your company's future and uh, just be prepared uh, for the things you're gonna have to do for the next 25 or 30 years. Peter, that's it. Again, thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Bob, standing ovation. Everybody, oh, everybody great. ovation. And, uh, and, and uh, Don Wilson is there and uh, you need to give Don Wilson a standing ovation because he is, he created, uh, along with Don Zriebeck and, and, and Tom Prey and others, he created the culture of this program. Um, Changed all our lives. And that yeah, is, that, 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 and uh, Marty and Jeff basically have sustained that culture, so. Absolutely. We can't thank you enough, Bob. Thanks for all you have done and all you continue to do to help all of us. Again, standing ovation. Oh, you're kind. Thank you. Anytime. Out of the park, out of the state. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I just want to make a note again to everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Tomorrow, we have a great speaker, Pam Sherman, a phenomenal coach and a leadership teacher. So we'll see you tomorrow at noon. And Bob, thank you again for a phenomenal, phenomenal introduction to what's changing. Thank you. Well, we'll we will see you in person next year. Great. Okay. I hope so. Cheers. Take care. Thanks, everybody. See you. See you at noon tomorrow, everybody.